God, you're good. You give us your word that we might know you, that we might know what we ought to do, who we ought to be. You give us your word, most importantly, to re- reveal your son and who he is and what he's done, that that might work in us and do a work in us by your hand, a work of salvation that we might believe in you and live our lives to know you and make much of you. Lord, we need help in doing that, so we thank you for your word that guides us and directs us, help us be a people and a church who takes your word seriously, who decides not just to believe things, but by the power of the Spirit to live out the purposes in which you've designed us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you'd agree with me, but sometimes Christians get a little bit tightly wound. Been there? We get a little bit too serious. We talked about that the last couple of weeks, about essentials versus non-essentials of the faith. But some of us in the church, to help others maybe, have the spiritual gift of humor. Think about Christian comedians. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Christian comedian. Mark Lowry is an older guy. from I think he's from Tennessee. Sounds like it. Tim Hawkins. Got some great skits. If you're on social media, you've likely seen in the last few years a guy named John Christ. John Christ is a younger comedian. He grew up in the church. Uh, He grew up going to church. He was in ministry for a while. He had some of his own personal struggles. But if you've been on social media, you'll see, man, he roasts the church and sometimes church culture uh, quite a bit. And, And sometimes it's important for us to laugh at ourselves. Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm gonna laugh at myself. We're serious, right? Some of us need to laugh at ourselves. John Chris did a, a, a skit a few years ago, and it was based on Google reviews. And his thought was, man, the church gets a bad rap, and Google reviews are often, Christians are often really rough on churches that they go to. And so he did a defense of Christians rather than roasting Christians. And I just want to share a few of those. I, I wanted to share the video, but it's a little bit too long. So I'm just going to give you four of the reviews that he latched onto, and then I'm going to give you what he said about those reviews of churches. Here's the first review from a person. He says, I just got bored quick at this church. Worship was not great. The sermon was much too monotone and screamy for me. To which John Chris rightly says, do you know what the opposite of monotone is? Screamy. Here's another one. I gave it four stars instead of five because there was no worship after the sermon. I'm glad we do that, by the way. I'm getting in trouble. And then John Chris replies and he says this, you know, in China, it's illegal to go to church and you have to walk miles to get there, but please tell us more. Third one, the worship leader looked like he just got done mowing the yard. (laughs) To which John Chris says this, I've seen a lot of worship leaders in my day, and I can't say the man is wrong. Sorry, worship team. We have a dress code around here. Here's a one-star review, and this is a real Google review, okay? The paninis were terrible. To which John Chris says this, this guy knows what church is really about, paninis. But let me ask you this morning, what is church really about? If it's paninis and the seats that we sit in that are really hard, we got problems. What's the church really about? What makes for a great church? What would you say makes for a great church? What's the church's purpose? What is the church supposed to be? And what is this church supposed to do in this broken world? What are your thoughts, expectations of how you weigh the good and bad of our church? Is who we are match who we ought to be biblically? And how do we know? What does the Bible say about these things? 
We come to the last couple of chapters in Romans. Man, I've loved being in Romans. We've been there since August. I kind of want to just extend it as long, longer. Romans is such an incredible book, but we're in the last two chapters of Romans, and what we've seen so far in Romans is just this great gospel deposit. We understand that we come to God not by our works, but by faith in Christ, that we are made right with God by faith in Christ, and that gives us new life that Paul talks about, new life and power from the Holy Spirit. And then we get to chapter 12 or so, and we see, okay, so how does this beautiful gospel, this good news of Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins and he changes our lives, how does that reflect in the way that we live? How does it reflect in relationships we have in the church? How does it reflect in relationships that we might have with our enemy? How does that reflect in relationships we have to the government and to the rest of the world? And so we've walked through the application of the truth of the gospel for a while here, and we get to the last two chapters, and and Paul's going to go from talking about just this beautiful high doctrine, and it's how that flushes out in relationships to how does that affect the church's purpose and mission in a broken world. Really, the last two chapters are kind of a farewell, but there's so much wrapped up in the last two chapters about the mission of of the church with this beautiful gospel that we're a people that not only spend time with one another and marvel at the gospel of Christ, but we take this gospel out into the world that we live in. And so we come to that this morning and we really see the church on mission and we see it, we're going to see it this week, we're going to see it next week. Turn with me to Romans 15. Romans 15, I think it's page 950 on a Bible close to you, on a chair close to you. If you don't have it, we'll have the words up here. I want you to bring your Bibles as we walk through it. Um, Romans 15, and we'll be in verses 14 through 33, excuse me. And we're going to see a number of things. We're going to see Paul's encouragement of this Roman church that he's been instructing. We're going to see travel plans. What in the world can we learn from Paul's previous travel plans and future travel plans about the mission of the church? A lot of great principles here, so let me walk through it. Listen, if I had a, if somebody invited me, if a church or a ministry invited me to come to a four-day conference, a missions conference, to encourage the church, to bring missionaries in, people from the outside that were on the front lines of missions, this is the passage that I would go to. I don't have four days, and so I've got four points. Let's read the text here. Romans 15, and we'll be in verses 14 through 33. Do you mind standing? This is a longer text. Maybe it helps us. The, I don't know if you knew this, but the, the, the early church, when God's word, out of reverence for God and his word, would stand. And so we like to do this every so often. We'll stand for God's word. Listen to these words. Romans 15, verse 14 and following. Paul to the Roman church. I myself am satisfied about you, church. My brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in this priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, in Christ Jesus then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles into obedience by word, by deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Arlicium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition, listen to this, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, Isaiah 52, 15, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Verse 22, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. And to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been well pleased to bring some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. 
for they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in the spiritual blessings, they ought also to be service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers. To God. On, behalf, on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Jerusalem, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, and that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Would you grab a seat? So Paul's previous travel plans, future travel plans, what in the world can we learn from the mission, uh, learn about the mission of God From Paul's travel plans that he opens the door and shares with these Roman churches. The first thought is this. And it comes from the first two verses that we just walked through. Verse 14 and 15. Your first thought for the day is this. A church on mission fosters spiritual growth and learning with one another. In other words, it fosters spiritual formation from within. Look at verse 14 and 15 with me again. It says, I myself... This is Paul encouraging this Roman church. I'm satisfied with you. The Apostle Paul, that's a a pretty big encouragement. Why am I satisfied with you? Three things. Do you see them? They are full of goodness. You see, filled with knowledge, able to instruct. Man, those three things are pretty incredible for a church to be about. This idea of filled or fullness is the idea that something like a cup that's overflowing. The first thought there is that we are full of goodness. Goodness is produced by the Holy Spirit, and the implication here is that this is called, this is character. That these people are overflowing and filled with character, godly character in the way that they live. Not only are they full of goodness, they are overflowing with knowledge. And knowledge is not just, in this case, it's not just what they know up here, but it's also what they are able to interpret about the world around them, their worldview. Remember, we're talking about going to institute to really understand not just truth, but how truth is applied to our lives, how we take things in our world and go, here's the right understanding of this. You see it in the New Testament. You see the call of a leader in the church to be able to instruct in sound doctrine. So this is not just knowledge in your head. This is a right understanding. This is like the doctor, the heart doctor that can look at a heart and go, I know what's wrong with it because I've studied it for so long and I understand it. We need that in our world. What a church, a church that was full of character in Rome, a church that was full of knowledge in the sense to be able to rightly interpret the world around them based on their understanding of the truth of God. And then the last thing it says here, look at it, it says able Able to instruct one another. The word able there, I like using Greek words every once in a while, is dynamis. The word, we get dynamite from that. Power, a ability. There's power to do what? To instruct. The Greek word for instruction. The Greeks liked education, if you remember. It's two words in Greek. It's nuos, the mind, and themalos, which is to place. So here's the implication. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you use power, the power of God to place in people's minds and hearts the truth so that they are changed, that their wills are changed. That's what we do in teaching and education, the power to change. We know that that comes from God. But what a a commendation, do you see it? What a commendation to this Roman church who had some problems, they had some issues amongst themselves, and yet they were full of, they were over Whelmed and overfilled with goodness, character. They were overflowing with an understanding of how the world worked from the truth of God. And they were able to teach one another and instruct one another. So a church on mission fosters spiritual formation to help one another grow with one another. This is the kind of church that a missionary like Paul wanted to be a part of, wanted to grow from. This is the type of church that people that want to be in ministry or missionaries can be taught 
that can be trained, that can be raised up in. When I came to faith, I came to faith in college at the University of North Texas, and by God's providence, he put me in a church that had all of those things, much like this church has. All of those things, what a great foundation of truth Denton Bible Church was, a guy named Tommy Nelson who loved the word of God and taught it, and then he had a heart to train up men and women for ministry. And man, I got to experience that. I got to sit under great teaching. I got to have people come alongside of me and disciple me and help me grow, able to instruct, full of character. Man, that church has produced so many missionaries. I think they have about 25 to 30 missionaries that have been raised up from that church and now sent out by that church. And I don't know how many pastors have actually come out of Denton Bible Church. But this is a place, first, when we think about mission, that has to have a biblical foundation, has to be a place where God's word is taught, where character is developed, where disciples are made. So the first idea is a church on mission has to foster spiritual formation with the people from within it. I I love the history of this church. Last week, we watched a video from Neil Sandoz. He was raised up here. He's a missionary Um, lives in Kenya, ministers primarily in South Sudan, loves Jesus, loves the gospel, trained up here. We've planted two different churches out of this church with a number of different men who are raised up here. It's a beautiful thing to be a church that's a hub for people, a place in which they can be raised up for the gospel. I think what this speaks to for us as a church is spiritual health. First and foremost, a church on mission has to have some spiritual health. So we see this, but we see something else here. What's the motivation for Paul as a missionary? Look at it here in verses 16 through 19. Verse 16 through 19, he's kind of reminding them what his mission is. Look at it there. He's like, God has given me grace. Remember, God called him from Damascus Road and called him to do what? To take the gospel to the Gentiles, not the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to go to the ends of the earth sharing the truth of the gospel with people that weren't like him, the kings and the queens of the world to the Gentile world. That's a large place. That's a large calling for someone. And look at it in verse 16 through 19. It's, here, here's how he sees himself as a missionary sharing the gospel with people who are unreached, people who don't know Jesus. Look at it. He's a minister in the priestly service of the gospel. Priestly service, so he sees himself kind of like a priest. See, the Old Testament, we get this imagery from the Old Testament, and, and look what he says. So that, what, what did an Old Testament priest do? They were set apart people in the way that they lived unto God, first of all, and then secondly, they made offering, both sin offerings and offerings to God that would please God. And so what Paul is saying is, is that the way that I see my evangelism effectively I don't see it as just this rote duty. I see it as an offering to God. I see mission as an offering to God, worship. That might be a different perspective that you have as you think about your own life and you think about the obligation and the calling we have to share the gospel with somebody around us. See, Paul saw it not as just an obligation, but he saw it as an offering to God. He's saying, I'm offering my ministry, the people that I'm trying to reach, as an offering to God of worship. Do you see it there? You see this mission to reach the Gentiles. It's interesting because the apostle Peter talks about this same thing. Not just with somebody as you know, high up and high ranking, for example, as Paul, because we kind of look at this text and go, hey, I'm not Paul. But Peter says some things about us. He says some things about Christians. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this. I think we'll have it up here. 1 Peter 2 speaks of this priesthood. I got it somewhere. 1 Peter 2. Sorry. Here's what he says about the church. Here's what he says about you. It is not just the Apostle Paul, but it's you and I as part of a people who have come to know Jesus. Here's who we are. Look at verse 4. 
As you come to him, a living stone, come to Christ, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourself, like living stone, are being built up into a spiritual house to be what? What does it say? A holy priesthood. This is the priesthood of believers that you often hear talked about. To do what? What do we do? We offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Back in Romans 12, we we talked about how our lives ought to be an act of worship, a sacrificial act of worship. Come down to verse 9. He says it again. We are a chosen race, a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, separate. That's what a priest is. He's separate, and he offers sacrifice to God that you may do what? Here's the reason that God has made us a priesthood, that we might what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So one of the purposes of God calling you to himself, one of the purposes of God saving sinners like us is that we might be an offering, we might give offering like a priest as his priesthood to him with our lives, but also with us sharing the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. Once you were, were not a people, now you are a people. Once you receive mercy, receive mercy from whom? From Jesus and the gospel of Christ that someone shared with you, that someone shared with me. But now you have received mercy. One of the beauties of this <coughs> is that when we think about our priestly duty, if you will, a priestly duty to live our lives in worship to God, to live our lives sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus and what Jesus has done. This is who Jesus has been for us. That he was a priest, but with a little twist, right? He's a priest that didn't offer other sacrifice outside of himself. He offered himself for you and for me. <clears throat> he was the sacrifice for our sin. And he calls us to be a people who are willing to share the beauty and the message of the good news with other people to live our life offering ourselves and offering who we are on mission to him as well. You know anybody like this that is that is it maybe in your life that's just a normal person, not the Apostle Paul where you kind of look at way up here is varsity. <clears throat> you look at a person and you go, man, the, the, the reason why they're, they have this contagious faith and, and, and the reason why they share their faith is probably not just this duty that they have, even though they do. It's just a delight. You know anybody like that? There's a lady that's been around here, and she goes to First Baptist Magnolia. We got a picture of her up here. This is a person around here that I think of. I'm trying to normalize this for you a little bit. The lady in the middle, some of you recognize her. Gatlin Elms, our former worship guy who's now in um, Oklahoma, that's his grandmother, Laverne Garrett. Laverne comes, she'll come in here and there. Every time I talk to Laverne, she's talking about Jesus. And she's talking about where she's taking the gospel. Right now, she's, in, she's 85, y'all. She's 85. She's in Panama right now. You go to her Facebook page, she's in Panama sharing Jesus with people in Panama who've never heard the gospel before. I asked Gatlin, I texted Gatlin yesterday and said, hey, how many trips, like, how many mission trips? Where all has your grandma been? How old is your grandma? Tell me all the things about him. And he's like, I have no idea how many mission trips my grandma's been on. And Hope, her daughter, is like, I don't know. We can't keep track. But this lady loves Jesus. I promise you she's not sitting there going, I just do this out of duty. She does it out of delight. The mission of God is a delight to her. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this. He says, because of the love of Christ, the love of Christ that Christ has shown me, I'm compelled. I'm compelled to share this good news with other people. Listen, that's a work that God has to do in our hearts. That's not A plus B equals C. Go do this, this, and this, and you will find this. When you figure out and understand how much you've been saved from, 
you can share with people what you've been saved to. Are you compelled by the love of Christ to share the gospel with people? Not just like the Apostle Paul, who's, that's who he was and what he was called to do, but like normal human beings like you and me. She's a great example of that beautiful truth. See, a church on mission fosters spiritual formation, but it also views and sees the gospel as worship to God. Is that the way that you see it? So there's a foundation. There's also, so we've talked about a foundation for mission. We've also talked about what's coming out of the heart for mission as as worship. And by the way, you, you need to understand this. The fuel of mission is always worship. The chief fuel for any sharing of the gospel that you do is worship. And here's why. Because the chief end of man is to worship God. And what God desires most is for every tongue, tribe, and people to have worshipers. That's what the end goal of all these things are, is worship. Not mission, but worship. So God wants people from every tribe and nation to worship him, and he wants to use you and me, the royal priesthood, to offer our worship to God by sharing the truth of the gospel. Have you ever viewed evangelism that way? That's how the Apostle Paul sees what he's doing. He sees his desire coming out of his worship in God. There's something else, though, because worship has to produce something. And some of you are going, yeah, that sounds really great. Well, what's the plan? Uh, Especially some of you planners, like, how does that work? This is what Paul talks to us next in this text about in verse 20 through 25. Look at it. Or the end of 19. (coughs) Third idea is this. A church on mission has to cultivate a biblical passion and vision or plan for reaching the lost. This doesn't just happen. We have to have a plan. Look at Paul's plan. Look at his passion for a particular special calling, and this may be a different calling for you and me. Middle of verse 19. So that from Jerusalem all the way around to Erlichium, That's 1,500 miles. That's the whole east side of the Roman Empire. Paul is going, he's already been there. He's been to all these different cities. If you read the book of Acts, he's going through all these different cities. And thus, verse 20, look at it. And thus I make it my ambition. Ambition isn't all bad, y'all. Godly ambition, passion, his heartbeat to preach the gospel Not where Christ has already been named. That's his special calling. I mean, you and I live in Montgomery County. Christ has been named here. This is his special calling to unreached people. We have a different calling, probably. Lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, look at this. This is Isaiah 52, verse 15. Those who have never been told of him will see. Those who have never heard will understand clearly Paul's heartbeat is for the unreached, the unreached people groups of the world. That's the calling that he got from Acts chapter 9 when Jesus showed up on Damascus Road and said, this is your calling. I wish, I don't know about y'all, but I I wish God would be, I, I wish Christ would show up and go, here's your specific calling, Seth. Wouldn't that be great? But he didn't do that with us necessarily. I don't know. Maybe he did with you. I've never had that experience. Paul had that experience, but look at where he still grounds his calling. It would have been really easy for Paul right here to ground his calling in his experience, in his experience in Acts chapter 9 only, but he doesn't ground it there. He grounds it in a text that says, tell people who haven't heard. That's important. It's important when you think about your calling. It's not just an experience. It's got to be rooted in the truth. So man, maybe you're Maybe your desire and hope is to care for the children in Montgomery County. You can find that in the scriptures. You've got to come to scripture and understand the calling. It's got to be consistent with God's word. So you see Paul's passion here, his single-mindedness here. You also see his vision. I mean, he has a specific way he's going to do this. Do you all see this? He's not just willy-nilly out there just talking to people. He has a plan. He has gone from Jerusalem to the east side of the Roman Empire, and he's gone to all kinds of different cities, mostly urban cities, and his strategy has been go to the synagogue and then go to the other regions with the Gentiles 
and share the gospel, see people come to know Jesus, and then plant churches. Plant churches, and then I'm going to go to a different region, because those churches can reach the people in their areas. This is a call to church plant. That's his strategy. He has a vision, a clear vision, and here's the deal. Look at, look at what he says this next. He's so single-minded, he says, hey, look, this is the reason, verse 22, um, so often I've been hindered from coming to you, because I'm I'm living out this mission, and oh, by the way, I've been hindered means God has prevented him from doing that. It would have been really fun for him to go visit this church, this church where he could have fellowship with people and be around God's people. I'm sure he needed it. I'm sure he needed it as this pioneering church planter who's being persecuted, but he's on mission. He's single-minded about what he's doing. He's been hindered from coming to him. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, were there people in that region that still needed to know Jesus? Yes. I don't think he's saying everybody in the east side of the Roman Empire is converted now. What I think he's saying is, is that my specific strategy was to plant churches and to raise up leaders in those churches who would reach the other people in those areas. So he hasn't reached all those people, but he sees his ministry to the east side of the Roman Empire as being complete. And look what he does now. Look at this vision and this plan. Since I long for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. I don't know how this landed on the people in Rome who've always wanted to meet Paul, but I don't know, maybe that lands weird on you, like when somebody goes, hey, I can come see you, but I'm going to come see you on the way to something else. I don't know how they received this, but here's the point. He's single-minded. He's, he's got purpose. He's got direction of what he's doing, and he's coming to see them on his way to where? What does it say? Spain. Spain is the very far west, not east. He's already taken care of east side. Now he's going west side, west side of the Roman Empire. And guess what? The west side of the Roman Empire was a rough place. It was like the wild, wild west. He's already been persecuted. Now he wants to go even further into this deal. Dude is about 60 years old. He's a pioneering church planter who wants to keep going. And this guy has a passion and vision for his calling. Here's the thing about Spain, though, y'all. When the Bible refers to the ends of the earth, like in the Great Commission, in the beginning of the book of Acts, Spain in that day in first century was considered the end of the world. I don't know if they're flat earth people or not. It was the end of the world. I don't know if you remember Old Testament, the prophet Jonah. Remember Jonah? Remember what Jonah's problem was? God called him to go to Nineveh, which were like the terrorists of his day toward the Israelites. He's like, not doing it. He had a problem with God's grace and mercy coming to his enemies. And so what does he do? He runs as far away as possible. He goes down to Joppa, gets on a, on a boat, and he goes where? Tarshish. Anybody know where Tarshish is? Spain. It's the end of the world. Here's what Jonah was doing. He was getting as far away from the call and mission of God to reach people with the truth of God as he could. That was Jonah's heart problem. But look at this. Fast forward to Paul. What does Paul do? Paul is going to the ends of the world to preach the gospel to people who had never heard. Do you see that contrast? Let me just ask you, and I'm going to press in a little bit here, but let me ask you a tough question. Man, in, in, your, in your most honest moments, would you rather run to the end of the earth to hide from the people that God is calling you to share his good news with? Does that sound like eating canned asparagus to you? Or do you want to run toward the people that God has called you to? And that may not be the ends of the earth. That may not be to Nepal. That may not be to North Korea. It may be next door. It may be to your family. Maybe to people you don't want to come to Jesus because of the stuff that they've done to you or your family. Do we want to run toward where God has us going? Or are we going to run away? And I've been dealing in my own heart with that this week as I say that to you, so I say that in grace. 
Maybe the problem isn't a compelling of our heart. Maybe the problem is I need more equipping. I need a plan. You see a plan here. We'd love to help you with that. We'd love to help you learn how to share the gospel with people, to give you confidence and and help you in that. The other thing you see here is that God has a heart. You can't not see this in Scripture. Listen, God has a heart for your neighbor next door. He has a heart for local missions. He has a heart for domestic missions. Lord knows our country needs it. He has a heart for places that have been reached, but God has a special place for people who have been unreached, who've never heard the gospel. You see it in the Great Commission. You see it in the book of Acts. You see it even somehow in a mysterious way. When Jesus returns, one of the things that kicks in is when all the Gentiles have heard. Why? Because God wants worshipers from every tribe, tongue, and nation to hear the truth of the gospel and worship him. Last point. We've seen the foundation. We've seen worship is what fuels all of this. We cultivate, we have to cultivate a passion, ask God for a passion and a heart to reach people with the gospel like Paul had. And last, we need to, to be a church on mission, we need to be generous. We need to be generous in supporting financially, refreshing, and praying for those on the front lines of ministry and mission. That's the kind of church that we need to be if we're going to be on mission. We need to be generous. Do you see it there? See, here's what Paul's done. Here's one of his strategies. Even while he was on the east side of the Roman Empire and all these Gentile churches, he still got his mind on the Jerusalem church that's being persecuted And there's a lot of poor Christians and people in that community in Jerusalem because of the persecution that they were experiencing. So even as he's sharing the gospel and planting churches, he's asking these different churches all through the Gentile world for contribution, for financial contribution to help the poor people in Jerusalem. And he goes around and he comes to the Romans and he's he's basically saying, kind of covertly asking for contribution. Do you see it here? I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid, okay, money. I've gone from Macedonia, verse 28, excuse me, verse 26 there. Been pleased to make a contribution. So he's telling them all these other churches have made a contribution to the poor among the saints in Jerusalem, verse 26. They were pleased to do it. They had an obligation to do it, but they were pleased to do it. And then he comes and he says this in 28. I have completed this, and I want to deliver this collection And once I deliver this collection and I come see you, I'm going to go to Spain. I'm going to go to the wild, wild west, and I want to share the gospel with people there. And look at what he asked them to pray for. Do you see it here? Verse 30, I appeal to you, Roman churches, to do what? Strive together with me in your prayers. What is he asking them to pray for? To be delivered first from the unbelievers in Judah. For some of you, that might be a proof text, man. I just want to be delivered from all these unbelievers that give me a hard time. That's not what this is. Sorry. I'll interrupt. The people in Judea had persecuted him a lot. So he's praying for protection from these people who are coming after him. That's the first thing he asked this church to pray for. And then second, the service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Here's the the context. He wants these Gentile churches to contribute to the poor in Jerusalem because there's been tension. There's been tension between Jews and non-Jews about things like circumcision and the law. We've talked about that in the book of Romans. And he's looking for an olive branch from the Gentiles to the Jews to create more unity amongst the church. What a heart. What a vision for unity in the church to help people see the best in one another, even in these non-essential ways that we've been talking about. And so he's calling for generosity. Listen, are we a generous church? I know gas prices are high. I know inflation is high. But man, am I more concerned about my 401k than I am about an internal investment in the kingdom of God to help people on the front lines of ministry? That's an eternal investment, y'all. 
I don't even... I don't even look at my 401k very often on purpose because I think I might get out at times. Man, this is an eternal investment we can make. So are you generous? What does it look like to be a generous church to people on the front lines of ministry and missions, to be an encouragement to them, to pray for them? Is that even on our radar? Is that even on your radar? Are there any missionaries that your family supports that you can pray for, that you have a thing on your, a little tag on your refrigerator that you and your family prays for and cares for? Man, is this on our radar to support and refresh and pray for missionaries that are on the front line? We want to be a church that does that. We want to be a church that cultivates a generosity for those who are missionaries, if you can get on our website and you can see the different ministries and missionaries that we support. Last week you saw the video of Neil. It was funny because last week he was going from place to place trying to see people like Paul is doing here. And then he's going back to South Sudan to minister to the gospel. He ain't had crust pizza in like a year. All right? So we want to refresh him. We want to pray for him. We want to care for him and his family. We want to be a, a church that gives financially a chunk of our budget goes out the door for missionaries to bless them financially, to keep them where they're at in unreached people groups in places where the gospel has not been gone and been reached. And so there's a number of ministries that we could point you toward that you could be a part of supporting. We're happy to do that. But we want to be a church that is generous. Are you generously giving towards an internal investment in the kingdom of of God. Well, the church is generous. The church just has to have a plan. Uh, the church trains and equips as an offering to God. But man, I, I said it a minute ago, but maybe you look at this passage and go, well, that's great because it's the Apostle Paul, you know, and he's this great strategic leader. He has a vision for all these things. He could share the gospel with a, with a tree, you know, and convert it or something. Like God was just using him. And I, what about little old me? Like I, 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 how, how do I even begin to be a part of something like that? A couple years ago, Tom Brady won his seventh ring with the Tampa Bay Bucks. if you're a football fan. Seventh Super Bowl ring, 2020. And it takes a while for these rings to be made and developed. Tampa Bay Bucks put 300, ladies, 319 carats of diamonds in a ring. 319 carats. I don't even know how you do that without hurting your other fingers. And then what ESPN and, and other sports channels will do on these ceremonies for sports teams who win the championship is that they will hone in and they'll hone in on like Tom Brady or, in this case, Mike Evans, who's a receiver for Tampa Bay Bucks. Is he still a receiver for Tampa Bay Bucks? I don't know. They'll hone in on these things. But man, there's, there are 55 players on an NFL football roster. 55. You don't see anything get honed in on them. You just see Tom Brady, Mike Evans. And the Tampa Bay Bucks give out like 200 to 250 rings. Not just 55. They give out rings to the people who've contributed to the organization getting to the, and winning the Super Bowl. The water boy guy who drives the bus, the executive, everybody in between gets a ring. Why am I telling you that story? Because listen, Apostle Paul might be like Tom Brady, but guess what? You're still a part of the program. You still get to participate in the kingdom. You're a royal priesthood. It gets to offer your offering to God. You're an important part the kingdom of God and the church. Man, it's easy to read about this great apostle. I'm not that guy. I'm not going to be the pioneer church planner. Man, God's got different roles for you than that. We live in Montgomery County. Maybe you're a kid and a student. That's your mission field. Maybe you're a young adult who works. That's your mission field. Or a spouse or a mom or a dad or an aunt or a uncle or a grandparent, God gives you a network of people in each of those places. And maybe you're a Christian who works as a mom at home, basically, or a teacher or a coach or a business person or a salesman or a 
small business owner or a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse, an engineer, on and on and on. God's given you a platform there. And the platform you may have isn't reaching unreached people. Maybe like in Montgomery County, we're convincing people that they don't know Jesus because we live in the Bible Belt. That's an equally difficult task to convince people they need the Savior when they think church attendance or family or a cross they wear or the culture they've grown up with is what makes them a Christian. That is a hard mission field. That's the mission field that you have and I have in Montgomery County to show people the beauty of Christ, that it's not all of those Christianese things that makes them know the Savior. But it's Christ and their need for Christ who died on a cross for their sins that they receive Christ by faith and put off and turn and repent from them, their sins and trust him and give him their life. It's interesting, the last words of Paul. It's interesting, too, that these prayers he asked for, they were answered. They just weren't answered in the way Paul planned. Did you know that Paul didn't come to Rome he was able to give this gift to the church, but he came safely to Rome in chains. Don't think he planned that, but it got him there safely, and he was able to minister in prison. And here's the thing. We don't know for sure if he made it to Spain or not. Some scholars think he made it to Spain. Some think he, does. he didn't. God had different plans. We can pray and ask God for things, and he often, if not almost always, answer it, answers those prayers in a different way. And yet God was still glorified. You know some of the last recorded words of Paul? Let me, let me let you listen to them. I am already being poured out, poured out, as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race I have kept the faith. Therefore, because of that, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. I'm telling you, it's better than 319 carats. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only me, not only Paul, the Tom Brady of his day, but to all who have loved his appearing, you and me. You know what some of the last words of Jesus are? To his disciples after he died on a cross, before and after he rose, before his ascension, the Great Commission, some of the last words of Jesus, where Jesus says, go, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit teaching them to obey all that I've commanded, and I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm with you always. Some of the last words of Jesus are also, you will be my witnesses, disciples. To Jerusalem, which they stayed for eight years in Jerusalem before they went to Judea and Samaria, and you know what got them out of Jerusalem? A little heat, persecution, and it pushed them toward mission. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then what does it say? To the ends of the earth. So here's your takeaway today. And I think Paul took these words to heart. Pour out your life, making Jesus' last words your first priority. Pour out your life, C3, making Jesus' last words your first priority. I think that's the way Paul lived. We can live that way as well. Let me pray.